I'm Rob Burke, and I'll be your host for the next hour. I work as an instructor and writer and all-around educational specialist here at ESRI. Also joining us is fellow instructor and arc objects specialist Jeremiah Linderman. During the presentation, you're encouraged to ask questions, and during those times when we can answer them, Jeremiah will be assisting. Welcome, Jeremiah. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Thanks, Rob. Let's go ahead and get started. We've got three topics to get through today. Each topic will be followed by some questions and answers and a demonstration at the end. The first topic is understanding arc objects. There, I'll try to explain the basics of arc objects to give you an overview. After that, we'll look at reading object model diagrams. There, I'll try to explain how to use the arc map arc objects diagrams to help you write some code. In the end, we'll talk about programmer interfaces. Not user interfaces, but programmer interfaces. If you're not sure what they are, stay tuned. The first topic is understanding ARC objects. The ArcGIS applications, like ArcMap and Arc Catalog, are built from ARC objects. These objects are basic building blocks, so things like maps and layers, and buttons and tools, and the points and lines and polygons. And in our catalog, the tree view and the different things you can click on in the tree view. Each of those things are building blocks. They are created from ARC objects. ARC objects are really programmable pieces that are assembled to build ArcMap and ARC catalog. Users and programmers work with the same objects. You may know what some of these objects are already because you've worked with the ArcGIS desktop applications. So you probably know point and line and polygon and maps and layers. You might call maps data frames, so the names might be different sometimes. But either way, there are these objects that are the building blocks. Users work with them, and so do programmers. Arc objects really aren't objects at all. They are a set of classes. There are 2,700 of them all together. Each one represents some basic building block of GIS. Programmers at ESRI write C++ code to build these classes. So the, a class like the layer class, there's code for it behind the scenes that's written in C++ to get a layer to look the way it's supposed to to let it have a legend and color options and symbol options. Programmers write C++ code to make all that happen. Then other programmers and users, like ourselves, we make objects out of these classes and then go about setting properties and getting the objects to do different things. Classes are stored in files, DLL files in your bin folder wherever you have Arc ArcGIS installed. These are dynamic linked library files. They hold all the C++ code in a binary format. One file that is a key to all the others is called the ESRI Core OLB file. It's an object library file that keeps track of all the classes. You don't usually work with these files. You don't ever go to these folders and work with these files. However, if you do any future programming work, you might reference these and take advantage of the code that's already been written. Objects, then, are different than classes. Objects come to life. You can see objects on your screen sometimes. When you start ArcMap, an ArcMap application window is created. It's an object. It only lives in active memory, and it displays on your computer screen. Layer objects can be created. You can make as many of these layer objects as you want, and then you go about setting their properties to get them to look the way you want. You set their color, their symbols. Objects only live in memory, so those layers are stored in active memory with the current property settings. If you were to quit ArcMap, those objects would go away. Before quitting, if you saved your work into a map document, the MXD file would contain the parameters that you set, the properties that you set, so that next time when you start ArcMap up again, it could recreate those same objects and they would look the same way as they did before.
layer, or I'm sorry, classes are code that live in a DLL file. Here we have the layer class. From the layer class, users create layer objects. Programmers also create layer objects from the layer class. Programmers do it with code. Users do it by clicking the Add Data button. When you go about changing a layer's colors, symbols, and properties, you're able to do that because the code in the layer class allows you to do that. One of the ESRI classes is called the Contents View class. And you might know the objects created from Contents View. They're the display and the source tabs in your Table of Contents window. I used Visual Basic to make my own Contents View class. I called it Rob's View. From there, from that class, I've created a catalog object. Whenever ArcMap starts up, my class has been registered with ArcMap, so it knows to create these catalog tab objects whenever it starts up. Let's take a look at this tab to see how I got it to work. If I click on the Catalog tab, I see that I've got a Arc Catalog Tree View. Here I can navigate through files and folders, just as you would when you use Arc Catalog. And then I can find a feature class and drag it onto my map. If I look at the Display tab, I'll see that, oh yeah, there's the new layer added to the map. You can use a variety of programming languages. As I mentioned earlier, I used Visual Basic to create that Contents View class. The ESRI programmers work in C++. Maybe one of the more popular languages is VBA, or Visual Basic for Applications. I say that because it comes with the ArcGIS applications. It's built into ArcMap and ArcCatalog. You don't have to make an extra purchase to get VBA. You've already got it if you have ArcEdit, Arc Editor, Arc Info, or Arc View. Well, to review this bit so far, we've talked about how Arc objects are really a whole bunch of classes stored in DLL files, and how users and programmers alike make use of those classes by making objects out of them. Objects come to life in memory, in active memory on your computer. When you're done with one of the applications, all the ARC objects are removed from memory. Classes are always there. They're always out there stored in, your, in the DLL files. Well, Jeremiah's got a whole bunch of questions listed here. Let's try to answer a few of them. Great. Let's take some questions that you guys have been sending in through the Ask the Presenter button on your display. So Ken from Klamath Falls, Oregon asks, if I write something using ARC objects from 8.1, will it work in 8.3? And the answer is yes. This is actually part of what's called the COM contract. All ARC objects are built upon the specified structure where they're guaranteed not to change, and they'll work from version to version. Some of you may have heard that we've been working in ArcGIS 9. We'll be releasing it this year. And anything that we're writing in ARC objects 8.3 will also be working within ArcGIS 9 as well. So that's nice to know. See, uh, Ken from Dallas asks, uh, can you uh, build ARC objects that run from Internet Explorer? Uh, this is a little bit advanced question. And no, we cannot uh, use ARC objects through Internet Explorer at ArcGIS 8.3. Uh, something else on uh, ArcGIS 9 that will be coming out, it's going to be a new product called ArcGIS Server that will allow us to do this. See, uh, Sally from Jacksonville asks, do I have to buy ARC objects? Uh, the answer to that question is no, you don't have to buy ARC objects specifically. When you have ArcGIS Desktop, you automatically get access to ARC objects. Just as Rob was mentioning, you can get access to VBA, where you'll be accessing the objects. The objects are already there. They're included with the application. Okay, I'll turn it back over to Rob now. All right, thanks, Jeremiah. Let's go ahead and move on to the second topic. Here we're going to look at reading object model diagrams. Object model diagrams are almost like roadmaps of the ArcGIS system. Similar to the way you'd use a map to learn a new city, you use the object model diagrams to learn how the Arc objects are organized. If you go to a new city, like Albuquerque, you might get a map of that city and try to familiarize yourself with the roads, the landmarks, and try to find your way around the town before you actually go there. You use the map to do that. You can understand the map and its symbols because there's a legend there and it tells you the, what all the colors mean. The red are interstate highways, the black are regular highways, and the gray ones are streets. 
When reading the ArcMap, or the ArcGIS object model diagrams, they look a little bit complex at first, too. But they are like road maps for the different groups of Arc objects. Earlier, I mentioned how there are 2,700 classes. There are about 30 diagrams to show those classes. Each of the diagrams are organized by topic. So, for example, the diagram you see here is the ArcMap object model diagram, and it shows all the classes related to creating the ArcMap display ArcMap window, ArcMap application. There's another set of objects called the geometry objects. They have their own diagram. The display diagram contains classes like uh, renderers for making layer legends, and color models to change colors, and symbology for points and lines and polygons. Each of the diagrams has a legend full of symbols to help you understand how to read the diagram. In the next few slides, I'm going to explain what all those symbols mean in the legend so that you can read the diagrams and learn to write some code. The diagrams use or are drawn with the unified modeling language. You see a lot of squares and lines connecting them and different symbology there. We tried to follow a standard when creating these diagrams called UML. It's an industry standard for diagramming object relationships. UML is made up of many symbols, but you only need to know about 12 of them to really navigate your way around the diagrams and start to write some code. I'll, I will define how to use these symbols in the next few slides. The one-liner symbol is called the association. These two classes, or as you create objects out of these two classes, the objects are associated with each other. The way we'd read this is that a chicken has an associated nest. The relationship here is one to one. There's just one line and no other symbols. So one chicken has one nest. If you saw one of these objects all by itself, you really wouldn't think anything out of it, but they usually go together in some, some way. The association can be more than just a one-to-one -one relationship. It can be a one-to-many relationship. The star here signifies a many or multiplicity relationship. The class where the star is closest to, that's the many object. So here we would read this relationship that a farm has many chickens. The multiplicity relationship can have an actual number. Here, a chicken has two wings. The number is closest to the object that has the multiplicity. The composed of symbol is shown with a solid diamond. Composed of means that the object, the object with the diamond is the composed of object. So we'd read this, chicken is composed of two wings. Composed of means that these two objects go together all the time. You wouldn't see one without the other. If you were moving the chicken object, its composed of objects would go with it. If you deleted this object, the composed of objects would get deleted also. The dash line and the arrow indicates a creates relationship. Here, one type of an object creates this other one. Chickens create eggs. The last relationship here is shown with a triangle. You read this one from the bottom up. So starting down low and going up towards the class that the arrow or the triangle is pointing up towards, you would say that a chicken is a type of bird. When you see this symbol, you should think inheritance. There's inheritance going on here. Birds have some properties and methods that are inherited by chicken. Sure, all birds have wings and feathers and a beak. Chickens are a type of bird, so they have those properties too. Inheritance does not go down here to these objects. This is not an inheritance symbol or type of symbol. So inheritance only happens when you see the triangle. The bird class is called an abstract class. It's shown as a two-dimensional box shaded in. Abstract classes mean that you cannot make any of these objects. Birds do not exist. You might be saying, wait a minute, Rob. I can see a bird right now outside my window. I would say, no, no, you do not. You see a specific type of bird. 
you see a robin or a sparrow or a cardinal, but in reality there are no birds. There are types of birds. The abstract class is really just there for generalization and inheritance purposes to hold those common characteristics that are inherited by any subclasses. All birds have wings, feathers, and beaks. Co-classes are shown on the diagrams in a three-dimensional box and they're shaded in. When you see a co-class, this means that you can create objects from these classes. Anytime you see a co-class, it means that you can write two lines of code to make one of these objects. These are your starting points. If you're not sure where to start writing code, you can locate a co-class on any diagram and in two lines of code you can make an object out of it. I'll show you the code here in just a minute. Classes are shown on the diagram also as 3D, but they're not shaded. You cannot make objects out of these classes. You cannot make eggs or wings. Other objects have to do the creation for you. You can see it on the diagram here with the creates relationship symbol. Chickens create eggs. If you want an egg object, you have to go to the chicken and have it make the egg for you. If you don't have a chicken, it's a co-class, so you could make one with two lines of code and then get it to make the egg. All classes have properties on them shown with the barbell symbol. Here, chicken has three properties, age, name, and color. Some of the properties have a left-sided barbell. The left-sided barbell means you can only get this value, but you can't change it to something else. So here for chicken, you could get a reference to its wing, but you couldn't give it a different wing. You couldn't take a wing off an eagle and put it onto a chicken. Some of the properties are called write-only properties. They're shown with a right-sided barbell. You can edit this value, but you can never find out what it is. So you could change the chicken's password, but you can never know what the current password setting is. To the right of each property is a colon and then a type. This is the value that the property holds. Age holds an integer value. Integers are numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Some of the properties hold the basic data types like numbers and strings and dates and Boolean values. Some properties will hold objects or references to objects. So here the wing property would give you a reference to a wing object. Classes also have methods. Methods are shown with an arrow symbol. Methods are like the actions that an object can perform. Some methods can return a value. Some methods don't. Fly does not return any value. It carries out its operation and that's it. Lay egg, on the other hand, carries out its operation and returns an egg object to you. This is how you carry out that creates relationship. This is how chicken creates eggs with the lay egg method. Well, let's start to write some code here. We have the chicken class to start off with. It's 3D, it's shaded in, it's one of those co-classes. That means you can create an object out of this class with two lines of code. To create an object, declare a variable. For the type, after the as keyword, use the class name. To create an object then, set that variable using the new keyword and the class name. Now you have an object in memory, and more importantly, a variable to refer to that object. With co-classes, you can make as many objects as you want out of them. So the whole time there's only one chicken co-class, its code is stored off in a DLL file somewhere, but from that chicken co-class, you can make as many chickens as you want, just declare variables, and set them using the new keyword. Say you want to change a property like the color property, or say you want to get the color property. When you look on the object model diagram, you always look to the right of the property to find out what its data type is. Here, color is a string. 
If you want to get the color property, declare a variable as a string, set that property or set that variable using the equal sign, and then the object dot property syntax. Your variable here refers to the object. Here's its color property. This returns the value that's stored in color and puts it in the variable x. If you want to use that value, you might print it up in a message box and here find out what color the chicken is. To change the chicken's color, you use the same syntax, object.property, and the equal sign. Here I enter a string that's quoted. I use a string because I know color expects me to set its value using a string data type. To run methods, the syntax is very similar, object.method. Some methods have an arguments list with parentheses to the right of the method name. If the arguments list has arguments in it, the arguments will also have a data type. Here, fly has a speed argument, and in order to get fly to run, you're going to have to enter a string in the line of code, and that is going to have to be some text string describing the speed. So here I have fly, and then a text string describing what speed I would like the chicken to fly at. If there were more arguments, I'd add a comma after the first argument, and then that second argument after that. Some methods return a value. Lay egg returns an egg. According to this creates relationship, this is how you will get to eggs. Egg is a class. That means you can't create an egg yourself. You've got to get the other object to do it for you, and the way to do it is with the lay egg method on chicken. If you want an egg, use the egg data type to declare a variable, or here it's an object type or a class name. Then set that variable using the lay egg method on chicken. After that, you've got a variable now to refer to your egg object. If you want to do something with that variable, that object variable, like check the color, you might print that up in a message box. Anytime you want to get to a neighboring object, there's always a property or a method on your current object to get you to the neighbor. Just earlier there, we looked at how lay egg gets eggs. Well, if I want to get to the chicken's nest, there's also a property there to get to the nest. So to get to a neighboring object, you need to write two lines of code. Declare a variable as that neighboring object, and then set that variable. Now I have two distinct variables, one pointing to the chicken, and the other point of the chicken's nest. I may need that nest variable because the chicken could leave, and I may need to check status from time to time to see if the chicken is in or out. The nest may also have a count property, so I can get a count of how many eggs are in the nest. All right, here in this section we've talked about object model diagrams, and I've tried to show you how there are about 12 different symbols, and once you know those symbols, you'll be able to start writing some code. There's a couple of steps that you always go through when writing ArcObjects code. First, you need to find a starting point. You can start with a co-class because you know you can make an object out of a co-class by writing two lines of code, declaring a variable and setting it with the new keyword. Once you have an object, well then you can start using properties and methods on that object. Sometimes you need to get to neighboring objects or create the neighbors. You can do that in two lines of code by declaring a variable for the neighbor and setting it with a property or method on the object you currently have. Once you have that neighboring object, you can run its properties and methods. All right, Jeremiah's got a couple of questions here. We'll go ahead and answer them. Great, thanks, Rob. Okay, Matt from Denmark asks, can you create your own classes in VBA? Yes, you can create your own classes in VBA. But remember, as Rob pointed out, there's nearly 3,000 of Arc Objects classes that are already available. So most people that are using Arc Objects have really have no need of creating their own classes since they are already supplied for you. Uh, this is an advanced thing that can be done, and usually when it is done, it's usually done in a standalone uh, programming language such as Visual Basic. Okay, Sarah from Fresno asks, if I have uh, VBA, how can I create an EXE, an executable, or a DLL format package? Um, well, an EXE is just a standalone um, application, or DLL is just another component that can plug into another application. With VBA, Visual Basic for Applications, 
We cannot create EXEs or DLLs. You have to go into a standalone programming language, such as standalone Visual Basic. So the answer is you cannot do it in uh, VBA, but you can package up uh, ARC objects into these uh, formats in other uh, programs other than uh, VBA. A similar question is, Margot from Hood River asks, can I write my own DLLs that distribute to users that don't have a copy of ArcGIS installed? So if I do create these other formats, if I want to supply them to other people, they also have to have ArcGIS installed on their machine if they want to use Arc objects. So anywhere you want to use Arc objects, that machine also has to have ArcGIS desktop installed. Uh, this might this will be changing a little bit in ArcGIS 9. There will be new products that enail, that will enable you to deploy Arc objects without a license of ArcGIS. Okay, and I guess we'll uh, turn it back over to Rob right now. All right, thanks a lot, Jeremiah. We'll go on to the next section here, using programmer interfaces. <clears throat> All of the Arc Objects classes are created using a standard called COM, or Component Object Model. COM is really just a set of rules that the ESRI programmers follow to create their classes. By following these rules, the classes become programming language independent. The code for the Arc Objects classes is written in C++, but you can access those classes and run their code from all kinds of other programming languages. We're be, we've been using VBA or VB, but you can use a variety of other languages too. Also, it allows the COM classes to work within other applications. If each application follows the COM standard and all the classes between several applications follow the standard, then the objects between them can kind of be mixed and matched and work together. And here's an example of that. I've been presenting to you using PowerPoint. And in my presentation here on this slide, I've added a data frame. You might be looking there and thinking, well, that sure looks like a, you just imported a JPEG or a BMP image. Well, no, this is a data frame. This is an ArcMap data frame. It comes from the ESRI map control. And it's got some special built-in functionality where I can zoom in on these layers. I've kind of customized the layers so when I zoom in on the states layer, uh, the labels know when to come on based on the scale. As I zoom in a little bit further, the layer knows when to turn off, and a new layer comes on, the counties layer. As I zoom in on the counties layer, its labels know when to turn on based on scale. I've programmed a couple of buttons here. I'm working in PowerPoint's VBA. PowerPoint also has VBA built into it. So I made a button here called Zoom All, and I wrote Arc Objects code to get it to zoom to the extent of all my layers. I created another button that goes into the layer and selects one of the states and zooms to that state based on user input here. So I'll type in a state name. I'm from Wisconsin here, so I'll zoom to Wisconsin. And the code knows to then zoom into that state. So here I've got arc objects working inside a PowerPoint. The reason that can happen is because the PowerPoint classes and the arc objects classes are created according to the COM standard. So they work together, and I can mix and match them between applications as I need them. The way this all works is that the COM classes have something special added to them called an interface or a programmer interface. This is not a user interface, but it's actually built into each class. When classes have interfaces, they can communicate with each other even though the languages are different. So for example, the ESRI programmers write the Arc Objects classes using C++ code. Well, you can program with those objects using other code, other programming languages. So here, the language really doesn't matter if the, if the classes were created according to the COM standard. An interface is quite detailed, and I just don't have enough time to go into them here, but you might think of a programmer interface as sort of a translator that allows code in one language to communicate with code in another language. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's about the most simplified version. I have to save my map work here in my PowerPoint presentation, and we'll continue on. On the diagram, interfaces are shown with the lollipop symbol. All of the ESRI class interfaces start with the letter I. 
So if dog happened to be an ESRI class, it's not, but if it was, it would have the iDog interface. Usually we were, were saying earlier in the lecture that a class has properties and methods. We'll just put interface in between there. And then the way we talk about it is a class has interfaces, and then the interfaces have properties and methods. Anytime you want to work with the Arc Objects classes, you must work through their interfaces. Now what that means to you as a VB or VBA programmer is when you're declaring your variables, you declare them directly to one of the interfaces instead of the class. So really the only thing different here about programming with interfaces is in declaring your variables, choosing one of those interfaces to declare to. After that, when you create new objects, it's the same code to set a variable, use the new keyword to make a new object, and the class name on the end. Once the object is created, you have access to properties and methods on the interface that the variable has been declared to. All COM classes have many interfaces. That means when you declare variables, you have to make a decision. Which interface should you use? You make that decision really based on the property or method you need. If you need to change the color property, color is on the iDog interface. You would declare your variable as iDog. If you needed to change the name property, name is on the iPad interface. You would declare your variable as iPad, create a new object, and then go about setting its name property. So when programming with the Arc Objects classes, you find the property or method you need, then declare a variable as the interface that contains that property or method. As a naming convention, we use a prefix P before any of these variable names that point to interfaces. P stands for pointer. And the way we talk about these variables is that they point. So here I've declared a variable, P pet, as the iPad interface, and the way I talk about it is that this variable, p pet, points to the iPad interface. When naming the variable, we use the prefix p and then the name of the interface without the i. By doing that, when other people look at your code, well, they can just look at this variable if they're maybe down deep in your code and haven't seen where you declared that variable. They can look at it and say, oh, you've used the naming convention. This must be pointing to the iPad interface. Well, let's look at an example here and create some objects and work with their properties and methods. All right, so I want to create a dog and set its color. The color property is on the iDog interface. That's the way I declare my variable, and then I can set the color property. Say I want to change the name of a, do a new dog. Well, name is on the iPad interface, so I declare my variable as iPad. Create the new dog, and then set its name property. In the end here, I end up with two dog objects. There are two different variables referencing each of the unique dogs. Each variable points to a different interface because I needed to get to properties and methods on the different interfaces. Well now, how about working with one dog? Let's make one and then set its properties and methods, but using several of the interfaces. Here I want to create a dog and change its color and its name. So I make the new dog, I use the iDog interface so I can get to the color property. Now I want to work with this same dog. I do want to change the name property so I need an iPet variable, variable pointing to iPet. But then instead of setting this new variable using the new keyword, I don't want to make a new dog so I'll just set the variable equal to the variable I already have. After that, I can use properties and methods on the interface that this variable points to. The other variable is still there. It still points to its original interface, and I could still use that variable too. What I end up with here is one dog object, but two variables that reference that same dog. The two variables each point to different interfaces. I needed to get to properties and methods on those different interfaces, but for one object. This technique of working with one object and setting up many variables to point to different interfaces of one object is called query interface.
or QI for short. Well, we'll take a little break here, and there's a lot of questions in the queue, and I'll have Jeremiah try to answer a couple of them. Okay, we'll get a few of these answered here for you. Okay, Nick from Minnesota asks, uh, how do you integrate ArcObjects code into other, into other applications such as PowerPoint? Do you place the code into a specific location in the hard drive, or does PowerPoint load the ArcObjects code into it? Well, you could, you could really do this a couple of ways. You could uh, work with a standalone application that calls objects from many different places. But probably the easiest is what Rob was showing is he placed the ArcObjects code directly inside PowerPoint. As we mentioned, when we have ArcGIS, we develop within Visual Basic for applications. It's an um, editing environment that automatically comes with ArcMap and Arc Catalog. While PowerPoint also has Visual Basic for applications, which we can open up and start working with Arc Objects as well. So that'd be the easiest way. Uh, Tom from Burbank has a similar question. He says, just to clarify, if I wanted to nest a map in PowerPoint like the demo, I still have to have ArcGIS loaded, right? And that is correct. We would also need to have ArcGIS loaded on our machine. That way it knows where to get the Arc Objects from. Uh, Lisa asks, remind me, what is a co-class? Well, there's different types of classes that we can work with. We have abstract classes, co-classes, and regular classes that are sometimes referred to as instantiable classes. Uh, most of this lecture we're working with co-classes. Now a co-class is a special type of class that can be created brand new. Uh, some objects we cannot create brand new uh, and we have to have different types of class representations for those. For instance, I could go in and I could create a data frame programmatically brand new. That would be an example of a co-class. There's other types of classes that I can't create brand new for instance, like a row and a table. Although I can create it brand new, I have to get it from another object. So that's a special type of class. I have to get that row from a table. So the table creates another object. So a co-class is just a special type of class that we're working with. And Rob from Wyoming asks, where can I find the model diagrams for arc objects? And Rob is actually going to go over that in the presentation here in a little bit and find out specifically where we can get that. But when we install ArcGIS Desktop, we get the option to install the developer kit. If we install the ArcGIS developer kit, the object model diagrams are all stored in PDF format automatically on our machine in the same location where ArcGIS is stored. And again, we'll go over that in just a moment. We'll turn it back over to Rob now. All right, there was a question about uh, what if you write code at 8.1 and you want to use that same code at 8.3 or at 9, will that 8.1 code be valid? And one of the answers to that is yes. And uh, it has to do with interfaces. If ESRI needs to change a class or change a property or method on an interface, one of the rules behind COM is that interfaces won't change over time. So once we've released a version of the software, the interfaces on that version will not change ever. If we need to make a change, we'll add another interface and carry out the changes on that new interface. If you decide when you get the new version of the software that you want to take advantage of the new interface, you could move over to the new interface, but the idea is that your old code will not break when you load new versions of the software. All right, we'll go ahead and continue with a little bit of a demonstration here. We've been working with dogs and farm animals, and now it's time to work with real Arc Objects classes. In my scenario here, we're going to work with a layer and change its name. As I bring up my arc map here, earlier I added a layer, a rivers layer. When you add a layer to a map, the name of the layer takes on the name of the feature class. So here my feature class had some odd coded name. And I want to change that name. Well, you might be saying, wait a minute, Rob, I could just right click on that layer and change its name. That'd be easy enough for me to do. Well, sure, the user can make changes, but on the programming side, we can write code to carry out those changes for the user and make it a little bit easier. All right, so here we're just going to work with the name property on layer. Name is a good example because I'm going to have to do the five main things that you would normally do while programming with Arc Objects. The first thing you would do is take a look at the diagrams. Look at those diagrams and figure out how you're going to write your code and try to learn which classes you're going to need. When you find out which class you're going to need, 
A lot of times on that class, there will be a lot of properties and methods scattered over several different interfaces. So you may have to use the query interface technique to switch interfaces from, to switch interfaces. A lot of times you have to go from one neighbor to the next. Yeah, because you may start with one object, but the object you need is maybe two or three or four objects away, and you may have to move from one to the next until you get the one you need. Once you have that object, then you can get to its properties and methods and run them. When you start ArcMap, several objects get created in memory automatically. If you start a new session of ArcMap, the application object gets created. The application object comes from the application class and it refers to the ArcMap window, like the status bar and the collection of toolbars and everything that makes up the ArcMap window. Also, an MX document object gets created. This is a map document. If you start a new session of ArcMap and you haven't really opened an MXD file, there's one there, there's an MX document already there, it's called Untitled. So these two objects are always there if you have ArcMap going. If you look at the relationships in the diagram, an application is composed of an MX document. There's no multiplicity here, so it's a one-to-one -one relationship. That means you've, whenever you open ArcMap, you always have a map document open too. Map documents are composed of many maps. Here we have the one-to-many relationship shown with the star. And then maps are composed of layers. Again, we have the star and the composed of relationship. Remember, maps are called data frames by the user. So here we have a world data frame, a world map, and then a USA map. Each map has multiple layers. Well, world only has one layer to it. You might be thinking, well, geez, I, I know these relationships. Do I have to, since I've been working with ArcMap for a while, of course I know that a map has layers and a document has many maps in it. Well, that's good. As a user, you may know a lot of the relationships that are shown on the diagrams. The main purpose for the diagrams are for you to learn about how the objects are organized, and mostly when you start to work with some new objects, how are those new objects organized, and what are their relationships, and what other objects are they connected to? Application and MX document are two places where you can start your programming work. I say that because they are always available in, in VBA programming inside of ArcMap. Remember, if you find a co-class, you can always start with a co-class too. Let's take a look at, at these two on the real ArcMap diagram. To open the diagrams, you'd go to the ArcObjects Developer Help page by going to your Start button and wherever your ArcGIS is installed. The ArcObjects Developer Help is one of the choices there. On the bottom is a Object Model Diagrams link. If you click to that, you'll get a listing of all the possible Object Model Diagrams. We want to go to the ArcMap Diagram because we want to work with the application, the map document. So I'll click on the ArcMap Diagram to bring up the Adobe Acrobat Reader. The diagrams are stored as PDF files. They're somewhere in your installation folder whenever you install ArcGIS. If you've installed the developer kit, you have PDF files for each of these object model diagrams. They are poster size. This one is 42 by 34. You could print them out if you have a plotter large enough. If you like, you could go to the ESRI store at the ESRI website. and You can always uh, buy some of these diagrams. You can get the whole set already printed out. All right, on the diagram here, as I go to the top of the diagram and work my way down this ArcMap diagram, the first class that I come to is the Application class. It's way up at the top. It's the highest one. Let's zoom in on Application to see what it looks like. As I zoom in on this class, I see that it is a class. It's three-dimensional. It's not shaded, so I can't make an application object here. I don't need to because it's already been created when I start ArcMap. It's always there and always available. There are a lot of interfaces available. The interface, each interface has properties and methods to it. If we look to the right here, there's a composed of relationship. And as I pan here, I see that an application is composed of one MX document. And MX document has its unique interfaces. 
and each interface has its unique properties and methods. MX document has a preset variable ready to use, already assigned for it. It's almost as if someone declared and set this variable for you. It's ready to go, ready to use. We'll go ahead and jump over to Arc, Arc Map and bring up the Visual Basic Editor and try out this code. All right, I've got a test subroutine here that I typed in before the session, and I'm um, going to use a message box. And here's that this document variable. Notice that I didn't have to declare or set this variable. It's just ready to go, ready to use. When I type in the dot, I see a list of properties and methods. What properties and methods are these? Well, the this document variable, as with all arc objects variables, must point to some interface. This document points to the I document interface. If we look at the object model diagram, For MX document, let me scroll down here and find that iDocument interface. And I'll zoom in a little bit so we can read this. The variable there, this document, points to iDocument. That means through that variable we have access to these seven properties. They're read only properties, so we can get their values. Back to my code here, I'm getting ready to type in some code. As I use the code completion here, I see that title is one of the properties available. I'm going to select that, and we'll go ahead and run this line of code to display the map document's title. And here it comes back and tells me the title is USA.MXD. You might use this code in some kind of an if-then statement. Maybe you want different sets of code to run depending upon the map document that's open. Your if-then statement could get the title of the map document. If it's one map document, one set of code could run. If it's another kind of a map document, you might run another set of code. This document is a preset variable. A second preset variable is also available called application. Application points to the iApplication interface for the ArcMap application. These are the only two preset variables available in VBA, so you won't see them really noted in any way on the object model diagrams. They are the only ones available because these are the only known objects. When you start ArcMap, you always have these two objects available and ready to go, and then you could add maps and layers and other things to the application or the map document to create other objects. All right, remember looking at the diagram, the iDocument properties were read only. And there's only about seven of them. Remember, we want to get to a layer and change the layer name. So let's scroll up here. We're going to need to look for another interface because iDocument had no way for us to get to a layer. All right, here I'm at the IMX document interface. It has a lot of properties and a lot of methods. One of them will get me to the active map. It's called the focus map property. This gives you the active data frame. Down a little bit is the selected layer property. This returns the iLayer interface of whatever layer happens to be selected in the table of contents. We need this property. It's on this interface, so we need this interface too. We're going to have to switch interfaces. This document points to iDocument. We need the variable pointing to IMX document. To get there, declare a variable as IMX document. And this is that query interface technique to switch interfaces on the same object. Set the variable, the new variable, equal to the variable you've already got, this document. Now I've got two variables to work with my current map document. I'm going to use this one here to get the selected layer. On the diagram, we saw the selected layer property returns the iLayer interface of the selected layer. To get to a neighboring object, you need to declare a variable to the neighboring object. You know which type to put here, or which interface to put here, when you look to the right of the property, iLayer. To get to the layer then, run the selected layer property, and that returns uh, the iLayer interface to this variable. So now P layer points to I layer. The I layer interface has the name property. We want to change the name of the layer.
In order to change the name, I'm going to need a string. To the right of name, you see string. So here, I can easily change the name of the river layer to rivers by putting a text string in quotes. Up to this point, I've worked with the layer object, and we've changed the name of the layer object. If we ran the code, it would look like this. The layer name would not change. That's because we've only changed the layer object in active memory. There are other objects in active memory, like the ArcMap Table of Contents window. We did not tell the Table of Contents window to do anything. We need to tell this window to check all the objects it contains and read their current status and refresh with all that current status. So we've got another line of code to write. Also on the IMX document interface is the update contents method. This causes the table of contents to refresh. It rereads all of its all the objects it contains, all their properties, and then refreshes itself with those properties. Oh, I want to run the code here, sorry. All right, so I've got that code written here in a subroutine called change layer name. I switched interfaces. I got the layer with the selected layer method. I changed the river's name and I did the update contents to refresh the table of contents window. Something that's important here is the selected layer property. This requires that a layer is selected in the table of contents. Let me bring up ArcMap. Right now, no layers are selected in the table of contents. If we ran that code, we'd get an error message. I need to select a layer in order for that code to run. I've selected a layer. Now I'm going to go to the Tools Macros choice, and I'm going to run the Change Layer Name subroutine. And look at that, the layer name now changes to Rivers. In that code, we updated the river object, or the layer object with the name River, and we also updated the table of contents and caused it to refresh so we can now see the layer name. Well, to kind of wrap things up here, we've talked about programming with ARC objects and using the object model diagrams. The way to do that is to find a property or method on the diagram, part of an interface or a class. That's your destination. You want to run some property or method there. Then you need to find a starting point. If that particular object wasn't a co-class, you may have to go somewhere else in the diagram to find a starting point. You might start with application, you might start with this document, depending upon what's appropriate. Or you might start with a co-class and write two lines of code to create an object out of that co-class. Once you've defined your starting point and your ending point, you really just connect the lines in between. And you go from one object to the next, declaring variables for the neighboring object, setting them using a property or method on the object you already have. Well, in the end here, we talked about interface programming, and that all the ARC objects classes are COM classes. They have interfaces. When you declare your variables, you use those interfaces. Sometimes you have to switch interfaces. If you have an object and you want to get to a lot of its properties and methods, you may have to go from one interface to another using the query interface technique. Well, we've got a few questions in the queue. I'm going to turn it over to Jeremiah to answer those questions. Okay, thanks, Rob. Okay, Jim from Oklahoma City asks, what's the difference between an interface and the object itself? When should you declare an interface and when should you declare the object itself? Well, when working with COM objects, we'll always want to declare an object as an interface. To answer the first question, what's the difference between an interface and an object? An interface is just a piece of an object. So I like to think of it as maybe looking at a car. You have a car which is an entire object. On that car, there's many ways of getting in that car. There's through the trunk, so that might be one interface to get to the engine. There's going to be another interface to get into the interior through the door. There might be another interface for the trunk. So interfaces are just different pieces of different ways of getting at the object itself. So when working with ARC objects and these COM objects, you'll always want to declare an object as the interface itself. See, Bruce asks, are there any plans to provide a .NET interface? Uh, in our upcoming releases, there won't be any changes to ArcGIS desktop itself. We'll still be using a VBA because it suits the needs of many of our users and it works just great. However, you can access ArcObjects through .NET. It's just another way that you can work with ArcObjects. 
So again, most people will be using ARC objects through VBA, but you can also use it in other standalone programming languages. And you can use some of the .NET programming languages as well, such as VB.NET. See, a few, few of you have asked this question. Um, I'm going to read this one from Luke. It says, you can uh, use C++, VBA, uh, VB to develop with ARC objects. Can I develop with Java? Um, at right now, at ArcGIS, we are limited to working with COM uh, languages within the Windows environment. And our future uh, releases, ArcGIS 9, there's going to be new products that allow us to work in additional languages as well as cross-platform, and including Java. So we're going to have a product called the ArcGIS Engine Developer Kit and another one called ArcGIS Server, which you'll be hearing more about. And I have another related question here. Um, this is from Tom and Billings. And it says, I've heard about Arc Engine. Is this related to Arc Objects? Yes, this is another product that will be coming out in ArcGIS 9, ArcGIS Engine Developer Kit. What this will allow you to do is create your own standalone applications using Arc Objects rather than customizing the environment. But again, mostly what we've been going over today are, are using a VBA to integrate with Arc Map, Arc Catalog just to customize our environment that is already there. Okay. Turn it back over to Rob. All right, thanks, Jeremiah. Yeah, there's one more question here I'd like to answer. It says, how do you know which object model diagram to use? Well, a lot of times when you're programming with ARC objects, you might be able to figure out the diagram because the objects you're working with. If you're working with the ARC map objects, the ARC map diagram is pretty obvious. If you're working with points and lines and polygons, you might be able to figure out that the geometry diagram is the one to use. Another place to go, though, is on the Arc Objects developer help. One of the diagrams you can open, one of the PDF files you can open, is called All Ob Object Model Diagrams. When you open this one, you see a listing of every single object model diagram. So here, if you know the class, or you know the property or method, or you have some idea of what it might be called, you might be able to use the search here in the PDF in the Adobe Acrobat Reader to find that property or method, class or interface, it'll zoom you or move right to that interface and highlight it for you in the display area. So if you're not sure which classes to use, open this diagram, type in the name of the class, and it'll find it for you. All right, those of you that would like to learn a little bit more about Arc Objects, there's a few resources available. One place you might go is uh, take one of the instructor-led training classes. We do have a five-day class. It's an introductory level class. It takes you from not knowing much about programming to knowing quite a bit about ARC objects programming. Then there's a three-day advanced class. In the advanced class, you'll learn how to do things like, remember earlier I showed you how, to, how I made that uh, extra contents view tab, the catalog tab? You'd learn how to do that in the advanced ARC objects class. There's also some virtual campus workshops. We have a series of these VBA workshops. There's four of them already. And there's also a six-module course on Introduction to Visual Basic version 6. There's a few books available from ESRI Press. One of them is called Getting to Know Arc Objects. This is a 20-chapter, 40-exercise workbook. This is for introductory level people that don't know a lot about programming. So the first few chapters teach you about VBA and programming with if-then statements and that type of thing. And then it works away slowly through object model diagrams and working with interfaces. And the last 10 or so chapters work with about 10 or 12 different object model diagrams to get you used to using some of the main ARC objects and programming with them. There are a few online resources available. ARC objects online is almost an extension of your help system. So it uh, describes how to use properties and methods, and you can look up different classes there and interfaces. There's also white papers and sampled code available. Then there's the VBA Toolkit CD. You can go to the ESRI website and request one of these. They are free, and they outline mainly VBA and how to get going with VBA, but they also, it also, the CD also includes several white papers it includes the first two chapters of exploring ARC objects. So the VBA Toolkit CD is it's a free place to start. You might request one of these CDs from the website. 
All right, it looks like we're out of time here for today. On behalf of ESRI, I'd like to thank you all for attending.